in the next three studies, we will be turning our attention to what I consider the most important passage, not only in the epistle to the Romans, but in the whole of the Bible. It is this passage that opened my eyes to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It laid the foundation of my understanding of righteousness by faith. And I hope you will receive the same blessing as we study together this passage, which is Romans 5, verse 11 to 21. You know, the great Swedish theologian and Bible scholar, Anders Nigren, referred to this passage as the high point of Romans. This is what he said in his commentary to Romans. The place to begin for an inclusive view of the meaning of Romans is the fifth chapter's comparison of Adam and Christ. This gives us the key to the whole epistle. When we attain to its height, all that proceeds and all that follows spread out before us in one inclusive view. We see how part fits directly into part. How Paul's thoughts move from step to step under its inherent compulsion. With this passage as our point of orientation, we can with surer understanding pursue the epistle from beginning to end. And that's found in page, on page 27 of his commentary on Romans. I believe Negrin is correct. If we can understand this passage, I assure you that you will truly understand the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you will truly understand what righteousness by faith is all about. Now, I must confess, this is a very difficult passage. It is, however, difficult, not because Paul wrote it to theologians. It is difficult because Paul's thoughts here completely contradict the Western mind. You see, he was not writing to Western mind when he wrote this epistle. He was writing to people whose mindset was very different from our way of thinking. And so you will have to remove your American caps and put on Jewish or Eastern caps as we look at this passage. Now, not only is Romans 5, verse 11 to 21, a difficult passage, it is also a controversial passage. More pen and ink has been used on this passage throughout the history of the Christian church than any other passage in all of the New Testament. I have yet to hear today a sermon on Romans 5, 12 to 21. There are many pastors who prefer to ignore this passage because they claim it's too difficult to preach. But that is no solution to the problem. For if we do not come to grips with this passage, my dear listener, we have not come to grips with Paul's message of the gospel. That is why Paul's message here in this passage is extremely important. And it doesn't bless us if we ignore it or skim over it. I prefer myself that we wrestle with this passage. I believe that we should wrestle with this passage as Jacob wrestled with the angel and would not let it go until God blessed him. I myself spent five years wrestling with this passage. I hope it will not take you that long. And what I discovered was a tremendous blessing to me and I want to share this blessing with you as we expound this Verses, verses 12 to 21, especially, of Romans 5. Now, I would prefer that we cover this in three studies, because this is heavy meat, and I do not want you to have spiritual indigestion. We will first, in this study, deal with chapter 5, verse 11 to 14, as the foundation for the next two studies. Let us now go step by step, and if you have your Bibles, please, Turn to Romans 5. Follow the logic of Paul's writing here with me. In verse 11, Paul is making a statement. And I'm going to read you that statement from the New King James Version. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Now what is Paul saying here? 
Paul has described for us the unconditional love of God by which we were justified while we were still helpless, while we were still ungodly, while we were still sinners and while we were still enemies of God. In other words, what Paul is saying in verse 11 is not only do we believers rejoice in the unconditional, changeless, self-emptying love of God, but we also rejoice in the fact that through our Lord Jesus Christ, we have already been reconciled to God. Something that has already happened. In the King James Version it says, we have already received the atonement. And then having made that statement, he plunges into the sin problem that we have in Adam. Now why does he spend verse 12, 13 and 14 describing Adam and our situation in Adam? What has Adam to do with our reconciliation? The answer is nothing. But you see, as you read the last part of verse 14, he tells us why he is expounding to us our situation in Adam. There, in the last part of verse 14, Paul tells us that Adam is a type of him who was to come. And of course, the one to come is Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul is telling us that there is a similarity between Adam and Christ, and so he wants to use Adam as a pattern, as a type, as a figure of Christ. Now, you may say this is impossible, for when we compare Adam and Christ, especially when we go to verse 15 to verse 18, we will discover that Adam and Christ are absolutely opposite. We will discover that Adam is the source of our sin problem. It is because of his sin that we human beings stand condemned. In contrast, Christ is the source of our salvation. It is in Christ that we stand justified. Therefore, how can Paul compare, use Adam as a type of Christ? Well, the answer is that there is one point. There is one area where Adam and Christ are similar. And it is because of this similarity that Paul can use Adam as a type or as a pattern of Christ. What is this similarity? It is this, my dear listener, that what Adam did affected the whole human race. Likewise, what Christ did also affected the whole human race. This is true only of Adam and of Christ. And therefore, Paul can use Adam as a type, as a pattern of Christ. And we shall see this as we go to verse 15 to 18. But before we do that, we need to come to grips with verses 12 to 14, which, in which Paul is using Adam as a type of Christ. He's describing our situation in Adam so that he may use Adam as a type of Christ. Now turn to verse 12. Paul tells us three things in Romans 5 verse 12. Let me read the text and then point out these three facts. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Now, what are the three facts that Paul informs his reader in this verse 12 of Romans 5? Number one, Paul tells us that through one man sin entered the world. Now, the word man, one man here refers, of course, to Adam. So, in other words, what Paul is telling us that sin entered the world through one man, that is Adam. Now, what does he mean by the word world? You see, the word world, the Greek word cosmos, has more than one meaning in the New Testament. At least six meanings can be given to that word. The context tells us what the meaning is. And here the word world has the same meaning as John 3.16 where Jesus told Nicodemus, God so loved the world. The word world here refers to the human race. To the human race that you and I belong to. 
And Paul is telling us that sin entered. Please notice the past tense. Sin entered the human race to which you and I belong through one man. The second fact that he brings out in this verse 12 of Romans 5 is that this sin brought death. It brought death to whom? To Adam. Because you remember when God created Adam and placed him in the garden of Eden. Eden. God said to Adam and Eve, and you will find this in Genesis 2 verse 16 and 17, that the day you eat of the forbidden fruit, he could eat from every other tree in the garden, but the moment he ate of the tree of good and evil, the forbidden fruit, he would surely die. And unfortunately, the sad story is that Adam did eat of that fruit. And the moment he ate of that forbidden fruit, now, he came under the condemnation of death. But the third fact that Paul brings out in this verse 12 of Romans 5 is that this death which came upon Adam spread to the whole human race. In other words, this death became universal. Now Paul is aware that this third fact would create problems. Because Paul is aware that his readers, especially the Jewish readers, were familiar with statements found in Deuteronomy and Ezekiel which says that the soul that sins will die, the father cannot die for the son and so on. In other words, no law will allow guilt and punishment to be transferred from the guilty to the innocent. Or in other words, no law will allow an innocent man to die in the place of a guilty person. And here Paul tells us that Adam's sin brought death to all men. Unfair, you shout out. How can I, why should I die? Because of the sins of somebody else. Well, that may be Western thinking. But Paul tells us why. And he tells us in the last part of verse 12. He says, because all sinned. Now, unfortunately, that is an incomplete phrase. And this is why this verse 12 has been a major controversy in the history of the Christian church. There are two ways you can finish the sentence that Paul started in the last part of verse 12. You can either say, all die because all sin like Adam, or you can say, or finish the sentence, all die because all sin in Adam. Now, which one did Paul mean? Well, first of all, let me give you the difference of those two interpretations, or two statements. If you say that we all die because we sin like Adam, then you are making Adam to be our example. You are saying that Adam's sin was my example, and by his example, he has led me to sin. If you, on the other hand, you say that we all die because we sinned in Adam, then you are making, making Adam the cause of our, our condemnation, our death. In other words, whichever way you interpret the phrase, for all have sinned, or inasmuch all sinned, you come to two different conclusions. And I want you to keep this in mind. Now the conclusion that I have come to is that we all die because we all sin in Adam. And I want to give you five reasons why this is what Paul had in mind. The first reason, of course, is a historical reason. It is this, that not everybody dies because they sin like Adam. Take babies, for example. Babies die even though they have not sinned like Adam. Therefore, if those who believe that we die because we sin like Adam, they have a problem with those who die who have not sinned like Adam. The second reason I want to give is, is the verb that Paul uses in that phrase, for all have sinned, or because all sinned. He uses the past tense, or he uses what we call in Greek the aorist tense, something that took place once and for all. 
if Paul meant that it is our personal sins that bring us upon us the death sentence, he would have used the present continuous tense, but he doesn't do that. He uses the past tense. The third argument that I want to present is verse 13 and 14, which is the immediate context of this statement that Paul makes in verse 12. What Paul is saying in verse 13 and 14 is this, that the people who lived from Adam to Moses, that is, the human race before God gave the law, died or were dying even though their sins were unlike Adam's deliberate transgression. In other words, what Paul is saying is this, that the people from Adam to Moses were not sinning deliberately were not breaking a law deliberately because God had not spelled out the Ten Commandments until Mount Sinai, until Moses. But these people from Adam to Moses, while they were sinning, while they were missing the mark, that's what word sin means, their sin was unlike Adam's transgression, and Paul is very careful in using terms, the people from Adam to Moses were sinning, but Adam transgressed, and the word transgressed means a deliberate violation of the law. In other words, Paul is saying that even though these people were sinning, and their sin was unlike the deliberate act of disobedience that Adam committed, they were still dying. Why were they dying? It couldn't be for their personal sins, because verse 13 says the Sin is not counted where there is no law. God had not yet posted his law until Mount Sinai, until Moses. And yet, while these people were sinning, God could not condemn them for breaking his law because he had not yet revealed the law in this explicit form until Moses' time. Now comes the fourth argument. And that is verse 15, 16, 17, and 18, which is still part of the context of this passage. Not once, not twice, but at least four times Paul tells us that we are judged, we are condemned, and we are sentenced to death, not because of our personal sins, no mention of our personal sins, but because of Adam's sin. But now I would like to turn to the fifth reason why I believe that Paul is saying that we all die because we sin in Adam and not like Adam. You see, Paul, as I mentioned earlier, is using Adam and our situation in Adam to, so that he can use him as a pattern of Christ. If you insist that we all die because we sinned like Adam, in other words, Adam is now only an example, but we die because we sin like Adam. Then for this analogy to fit Christ, we would have to teach that we all live, we are all justified because we have obeyed like Christ. But the fact is that nobody has obeyed like Christ. In fact, you remember in Romans 3 verse 9 and 12, right, 9 to 12, what Paul tells us, that all have sinned that all have come under, the, uh, come under sin. There is none good. There is not even one that is righteous. There is only one man that has lived a perfect, righteous life. That is Jesus Christ. No other human being has fully obeyed the law as Christ has. And if you teach that we die because we sin like Adam, then you would have to teach, to be fair with Paul's analogy, that we are saved, we are justified, we live because we have obeyed like Christ. And that is far from Paul's teaching. In fact, it totally contradicts Paul's teaching. All through his writing, he condemns justification by the works of the law. Therefore, what Paul is saying is that we all die because we sinned in Adam and therefore, since he is a pattern of Christ, we all live, we are all justified because we have obeyed in Christ. Now I know this is difficult, but you see this argument is based on biblical solidarity. 
And biblical solidarity simply means this, that God created all men in one man. You see, you were not created. I was not created when your mother or my mother conceived us. God created all men in one man. That is why the word Adam in Hebrew means mankind. It has a collective significance. That word Adam is used 510 times in the Old Testament. And in the majority of cases, it has a collective significance. Likewise, God incorporated the whole human race in one man, Jesus Christ. In other words, in other words, just like God created all men in one man at creation. In fact, Acts 17 verse 26 says so. Out of one, God created the whole human race that dwells upon this earth. Likewise, at the incarnation, God united his son to the corporate human race that needed redeeming. So that Christ became the second Adam, the second mankind. And God did that so that the history of Christ may become our history. Now, having said this, let me go quickly and explain verse 13 and 14, which is an explanation, or which is an uh, ex ex expounding of verse 12, especially the last part. Paul tells us in verse 13 of Romans 5, that until the law, and by that he means until God spelt out the law through Moses, sin was in the world. The human race who lived before Moses was sinning. Nevertheless, he says, Sin is not counted, it is not imputed, it is not reckoned, whether of Romans, that the law was in the conscience of the Gentiles. These people were sinning, Paul says. But God had not yet posted the law until Moses. And since he had not posted the law until Moses, legally he had no right to condemn them for their sins. Yet, in verse 14, Paul says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. These people were dying. And since God is a just God, Paul's implication here is that they were not dying for their personal sins. They were dying because in Adam they had already transgressed. You see, when Adam sinned, you and I were implicated in that sin. We did not choose to sin in Adam, so we are not guilty of Adam's sin. Original guilt is a heresy. It is not taught in the Bible. But we were in Adam when he sinned. We were implicated in his sin. Therefore, the condemnation that came to Adam, the condemnation of death that came to Adam was passed on to us. As Paul brings out in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 22, in Adam all die. In other words, you and I, because of Adam's fall, were born in death row. Now you say, this is unfair. No, it is not unfair in the way you look at it. It is unfair in this sense. The moment Adam sinned, he should have died. And if he died, where would you and I be? Let me put this question towards to you, dear listener. If your great-great-grandfather died at the age of three, where would you have been? You would not have existed because you would have died in him. Likewise, had Adam died the moment he sinned, and that is what he deserved, that would have been fair. The whole human race would have died in him. But the fact is that God allowed Adam to live. And because Adam lived, he had children, and his children had children until you and I were born. But why did God allow the human race to live when they deserved death? Because he had a plan to save you and me. He had chosen you and me in Jesus Christ. Hebrew, sorry, Ephesians 1 verse 4. He chose us in Christ from the foundation of the world that we might be holy and blameless before him through his son Jesus Christ. And so Paul is describing for us here in Romans 5, verse 12 to 14, our hopeless situation in Adam. You see, you and I are not born neutral. We are born under the death sentence because you and I are the children of Adam. And there is nothing you and I can do to change that death sentence. 
And that is why I said earlier, you and I are born in death row. You know, in Galatians 3, Paul gives us another function of the law in verse 23 and 24. He tells us that God gave the law in order to lead us to Christ. The law put us in the prison cell of death until Christ came and set us free. And that is why Jesus in John 8, 32 tells the, the Jews that you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. By the word truth, Jesus meant himself. For in verse 36 of John 3, uh, John 8 rather, Jesus said, If the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And so, it is important that we come to grips with this passage that we have covered today. Romans 5, verse 12 to 14. We need to come to grips with the fact that you and I are born sinners. We are born condemned in this world. And that our only hope is in Jesus Christ. And so it is my prayer that you and I will realize that sin is not something that we have produced. We are born under the sin problem. Sin is something that you and I inherit. As we shall look at Romans 5 verse 19, Paul tells us that Adam's sin made us sinners. It constituted us as sinners. And so a baby, while it is born innocent in the, in, in the sense of experience, a baby is not born innocent under the law of God. A baby is born under the condemnation of the law. And so, because of this, every human being needs a savior. And as Paul said to the jailer, if you believe you and your household will be saved, so also, our only hope is in Christ. And that is what we will cover in our next study. But it is my prayer that you will realize that you and I are born under the hopeless situation of condemnation. And that only through Jesus Christ we have hope. And it is my prayer that you will, ex you will realize that there is only one righteousness that qualifies you for, to heaven. It is the righteousness of Jesus. It is my prayer that you shall know this truth and the truth will set you free. Amen.